Okay, welcome, welcome on a wonderful Friday, wonderful rainy Friday. Um, we uh, we have a special guest today, and uh, we're very very excited. Um, Dr. John Gardner is here, and he is uh, currently a professor of mechanical engineering department here, and also the director of the uh, of Siri, I guess is, uh, is still what we say. Um, and prior to that, he was.
uh, think about a little bit about your history. Uh, the United States um, had been established across the entire continent. We weren't all states there, I think. Well, I think I don't begin to think 1885, if I remember my, my history correctly. Uh, the element of the, we understood the fundamentals of that. We had the periodic table. Gregor Mendel was doing his work in the UK, understanding genetics. Um, and, and that's just an analogy of the genetics. That's just the other things that are based on the And that's just Western science. Right? So Western science. We're not primitives. And we had a lot to go. And in fact, there's this whole genre of literature and entertainment that that takes this branch. gets credit for inventing the grid because it was 1882 that he started um, Edison Illuminating Company in Manhattan Island powering 400 light bulbs for 82 customers. There was not a screaming market for electricity. People weren't saying, boy, I want somebody to deliver electricity in my house. And that's not what he was selling. He was selling light. Right? That's, why it, that's why these early companies were called the Illuminating Company because he wanted to sell his light bulbs. This is part of Edison's genius, if you read anything about his history. Certainly he was technologically advanced, but boy, did he know business, right? So he invented this whole, this whole business model of a, of a commercial utility to sell more light bulbs. And he was very successful at it. He was, he was a, a very, uh, you know, almost a scrupulous businessman. He used to hire children to go around at night around Manhattan looking in windows to see uh, whether there were gas lighting or whale oil lighting uh, in, in some of these big these brownstones, these mansions along Manhattan. And they'd report back, and those would be the people he'd target for a salesman to go out, and they'd say, you know, those gas lights, you know, that you're going to burn your place down. They're dangerous. They're, you know, they're, the fumes are going to kill you. So they employ a lot of your scare tactics, and they convert to electricity, because we know nothing goes wrong with electricity. Um, so. Um, so, so we, we, we started that, and at the same time that he, and, and that, by the way, that, that, um, that grid in Manhattan was powered by a coal plant. That was, that was one of the first coal-powered electric generating stations. Uh, but at the same time, we were developing hydro stations. Through the 1880s, uh, we had the first hydroelectric station in Niagara Falls. There was one in Michigan. And by the end of the 1880s, there were 50 hydroelectric plants, either built or in process, as far west as California. So this technology was already taking off in parallel to developing the, the, the grid based on coal. Um, check my notes here, make sure we're good. So, so what about what we see as the, sustain, the other sustainable um, technologies, wind and solar? That was happening, well wind, of course, has a long, rich history, right? It happened, uh, you know, there's ruins of a, of a windmill in Persia that dates back from like 2000 BC, right? And of course, everyone knows the stories of, of Dutch people using wind mills to pump the water out of their, their land. Um, across western United States are the wind-powered irrigation pumps and, and, and stock uh, watering pumps for the, for the ranchers, those metal pinwheels uh, that have become just sort of iconic of the western landscape. Um, the first solar cell was demonstrated in 1890, so that technology was, was, was not. And in fact, 
Einstein got one of his uh, Nobel Prizes for, uh, for dis explaining that effect, right? So, so this was a really big part of the culture even then. Um, but let's talk about wind for a second because I just ex described a bunch of things we, we, we use wind for for mechanical work, you know, milling grain, pumping water. But how about creating electricity? Certainly that came later, right? Well, this is a picture from Scientific American in 1888. And it is a windmill built, again, in the technological hotbed of Cleveland, Ohio, east side of Cleveland, off Euclid Avenue. This was Charles Brush's mansion uh, back here. He built this thing, and he used that windmill, that wind energy, to run what he called it a dynamo. We call them generators. That was what his company did, was he made better and better dynamos for the hydroelectric industry. But uh, he, he created this, and he used this to, to be, the wires went back to the basement of his mansion where he had lead acid batteries in big glass um, vats. And he, and, and he stored the electricity in his batteries and he used that to light his mansion over the course of the evening. So I think that bears repeating. In 1888, we had, oh, by the way, I wanted to show you, that's a person right there. So that gives you a sense of scale. Um, I'm trying to imagine what his neighbors thought when this thing was going up in the backyard. Um, but no HOAs. No HOAs. <laughs> well, there probably were, but he ran. <laughs> it's like, you know. um, so we had we had a wind turbine creating electricity, charging batteries, and if that sounds familiar, it should, because in 2017, uh, Tesla installed the world's biggest battery in South Australia to, uh, to, to help balance the grid with the increasing wind energy that's going on there. Um, and so, uh, so, so it took us about 130 years to get back to that future, uh, which is what we're doing right now, uh, because we realize that that's the problem. The grid itself has very little natural storage, inherent storage. And so if you've got a variable generator like wind or solar, you need to somehow buffer that out with the variation of, our, of how we use electricity. Right? And that's one of the reasons why people say, oh, yeah, you can't get rid of coal plants or gas plants because they, we need those. Well, we don't. We can, we can develop it another way. So, so we, could have gotten, you know, we could have gotten there. But we didn't because coal was just too easy. I think it's important to realize how incredibly valuable the fossil fuels are. They're, 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 they're storable, right? They, in fact, we know they're storable because they've been sitting in the crust for, you know, millions of years. <laughs> and they're, they're, they're doing just fine. You can pile them up outside a, a power plant, um, and, and they store just fine. So um, the other way to think about fossil fuels, by the way, is if you think about where they came from, you know, the term fossil is they were, they were living uh, uh, organisms, mostly plants, that were lushly growing on the surface of the earth and they died and piled up and then floods came and, and geolog long geological processes and mechanical pressure and heat transformed the carbohydrates that are in living things to the hydrocarbons we know today. Okay? So if you think about that, how those carbohydrates come to be, well they came to be because the plants took in water, took in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and used solar energy to, to, to transform those fundamental molecules into these more complicated molecules that had energy content. Too. So one way to think about a lump of coal is that it's highly concentrated solar energy. But it is, it, it is, a, it is a method of storing solar energy. And it's getting that carbon dioxide that the plants fixed in the, um, into the plants in a time, an era when there wasn't any, any higher organisms, certainly no, 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 no uh, humans, and no civilization as we know it, that was a much hotter climate for the, for the planet at that time. Uh, and we've gone through much, many different changes in the climate. It's that carbon dioxide that was sucked out of the atmosphere you know, millennia ago, millions of years ago, and now is being released over the course of decades rather than millions of years is what's, what's tipping our balance and causing our problems. But if we didn't have those fossil fuels, we still we still had that drive, right? We still we still wanted the conveniences of, that electricity brings us. We wanted refrigeration, right? We wanted a cold beverage. We wanted a comfortable environment. We wanted motive power, right? We were developing motors and, and, and generators. So all the effort that brought us things like turbocharged SUVs would have been 
moved in another direction. And we would have developed a grid that would have worked. It just wouldn't have been the same thing. So one of the, I have a friend of mine who used this phrase, and it's perfect for this, is uh, you know the old saying, necessity is the mother of invention. A better way of saying it is necessity is a mother. Right? <laughs> It'll really drive us to do things differently. OK. Um, so, so we should think a little bit about what a, what a, what a fossil-free grid would look like. So it would have more storage in it. It would inherently have more storage. But we would have evolved it differently. We would have used it differently. One of the things that the big power plants did for us is it gave us the opportunity to completely decouple the way we use electricity from the way it's generated. So nobody thinks twice about turning on a switch. When Micron wants to start a big piece of equipment to do processing of chips, they don't ask permission. They don't have to start up a generator and compensate for it. We, we, we know how to do that, right? If the grid was more limited, we would probably have evolved the way we use electricity a little di differently. We would have been more connected to it. We wouldn't have. To, we wouldn't be able to do it without thought. That doesn't mean it would have been bad. In fact, I want to talk about a little bit about how that would, might have had some good implications as well. We might not have developed this massive nationwide network of of generators, right? We, we, because the, the, the big generators would be the hybrid generators, that would have influenced the way we develop cities in, the, in, in this country because because you know, much of the country was developing along with the electric grid. So there probably would have been a higher concentration of urban centers and manufacturing and, and industry around the hydro centers. So Niagara Falls probably wouldn't be a sleepy little, little um, tourist town, right? It would be, be a Chicago. Um, so same with upstate New York and and, and the, the Sierra Nevada, right? There would have been a much different distribution of, of population. And the grid probably wouldn't have been all connected. There probably would have been, because it would have been more concentrated around the hydro centers or windy centers, there would be um, less incentive or less ability to move transmission wires across them. Which is an interesting point because that's where we're headed now. A lot of the discussion about renewable energy is this topic of microgrids, right? Uh, small isolated things. They're still connected to the big grid, but they're more self-contained. And the reason that's important is because that's, there's some inherent resilience to that. Right now, these, we, we have this, the, the, the grid's so interconnected that not only does electricity flow quickly at the speed of light, so do problems, right? So when something trips off, uh, it can propagate through, and instead of having one generator go down, you might have a dozen generators go down, and instead of a neighborhood going black, you've got several cities going black. And you have much, there's, there's much of that history in the United States of, of massive blackouts from like one small problem that just just propagated through the whole system. So I mentioned that the the development of this of the country happened about the same time as we were developing the electric grid. But also what's going on, I mentioned in 1879 uh, we, we, we they, they found a use for this big puddle of black slime in uh, Titus Valley, some, someplace in, in central Pennsylvania. And they said, hey, you can burn this stuff. Maybe you can burn it better. Anyway, we, we started using petroleum. And at the same time, we were developing the internal combustion engine. Again, 1880s is a big time for, for that development. Uh, and that gave rise to the automobile. And having that level of personal transportation available to us completely influenced the way we develop cities, right? Because um, we didn't have to rely on horses to get around. And we could we could live further away from, say, where we work. It, it, it's, it's the automobile that gave rise to this phenomenon known as the suburbs, which um, there's a, um, I can't remember the guy's name, one of, one of the people who writes a lot about sustainability in the economy, said that was the single biggest waste of human resources in, in the history of mankind, the suburbs. Because uh, it, it changed not just you know how we lived, it changed, it changed a lot about our culture. There's a lot of writing about how like, more isolated we've gotten and, and less of a less of a community feel. But that's but if we hadn't had the automobile, our cities would have been more compact, more walkable, more open to other transportation uh, techniques, and um, and in fact they would probably look a lot like the old world cities like how, how Europe developed. Because Europe developed their cities and their infrastructure before cars came along. And so when you go to Europe, yeah, they've got dense urban areas, but you get outside there, they're in, well, there's now starting to be sprawling suburbs, but, but 
but historically they weren't. There, you, you would leave the city and you're in farmland because they needed the farmland. Within a, a day's cart, you know, horse and cart ride to bring the food into the cities for the people to eat. And so, if if we were we had a, a, a fossil free grid and we didn't have petroleum, we wouldn't have automobiles per se. We would have electric vehicles, and they probably would start anyway with smaller things, right? We, they wouldn't start with a 57 Chevy or an SUV, they'd start with small personal vehicles, probably went slower, um, and, uh, and you know, small batteries, uh, some shorter ranges, uh, and it might look something like this, right? which of course is what we have now. Hopefully if they'd have done this earlier, we would have now solved all the safety problems that we're grappling with, but, um, but, but certainly that's, that's in there. Okay. Um, Okay, so so one of the points I want to make is yes, if, if we didn't have fossil fuels, life would be very different now. But I don't think it would be worse. Okay, and and one of the ways you know a lot of things we take for granted we wouldn't have. Um, you know a lot of the, the tools we use to make our life easier every day. Certainly the automobile is one of the things I mentioned. Power tools would be uh, would would have evolved differently. Lawnmowers, things like that. So things that we now rely on the developed energy infrastructure to do, we would probably still have to do by hand. And, and I would argue that would be a good thing, right? And, and here's, so I've got a series of graphs here I want to walk you through. Uh, because they address the premise, if you talk to anybody about energy intensity, about how much energy per person is used in a country, they will say, for good reason, that that's a good indicator of quality of life. The more energy we have available to us, the better our lives are. Uh, and, and that's unarguably true. But the problem is, is that's true only up to a point. And we have gotten, and most of modern society, I'm not going to pick on American, have gotten so far beyond that, we've lost track of that. So there's a, there's a, a, a website out there called gapminder.org. Uh, and, and speaking of TED Talks, Hans Rosling, who's, who's since passed away, uh, has a series of TED Talks that'll just blow your mind. So if you ever get a chance to do that, please, um, you know, when you're done studying in your homework, go ahead and over to Ted and, and, and watch some of Hans Rosen's talks. But, but he um, has uh, a series, he's got this great way of, he's got access to this giant database about energy and health and transportation and economy and, ha and, and has it broken down by country and by region and by continent and, and, he, and he has it broken down by year and you can animate these graphs and watch how one thing relates to another and how it changes over time. It's fabulous. I didn't have time to set up the animations, um, and I didn't do it on the TED Talks because I didn't, I didn't trust the technology. But I have a series of graphs that still, that still talk about it. So one of the things you can do is you can choose an indicator of quality of life. And, and a lot, for a lot of the, the social scientists who work in this area, they say child mortality, right? The better, the, better your, the better developed your country is the lower your child mortality. And in this case, they define child mortality as the number of zero to five year olds who don't make it. You know, uh, children who were born but didn't make it to their sixth birthday, right? And um, and over here is energy use per capita, right? And we could plot countries on here uh, and 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 watch how they move over time. So this was a, this is a snapshot 2015. Here's the United States. The size of the bullet uh, the, of the blob uh, refers to the population, so bigger, more more people. Um, and so what you would expect is if you go to lower energy use, you'd go high on the child mortality thing, right? And so you'd probably expect a line that looks like this, right? So back in history, when we go further back, we have much higher uh, child mortality, which is true, of course, we do. But, it, but, but it's interesting if you look at countries around the world that are in various stages of energy development, where, you know, the, the, uh, the, the Western, what we call the Western, the economically developed countries are much further along, but there's some that, have, that, are, that, that are more recently developed, right? So let's look at a couple of these. So this is Egypt that goes from 1971 to 2014, and you see a steady increase in energy use and a, and a steep drop in child mortality, but boy, that's a steep drop. In other words, you can see that that first increment made a huge difference, and then as you get, as those dots get a little closer, you don't see as much progress, right? 
and, and in fact, it, it, it looks like um, and, and here the energy use might have actually gotten a little bit lower. So as we're getting into modern time, energy use per capita in all the countries are tend to plateau out a little bit. Uh, but so is um, child mortality. So over here we look at Spain, so further along in our, in our um, um, uh, pro in, in the development, right? So you see that they're, they, they've started in about the same place, and now they're, they're, they've turned the corner, and you're seeing a, a plateau out here. So you're seeing from here to here, uh, uh, you know, an increase, a decrease in child mortality, but, but, a, but a much larger increase in per capita energy use. So, so that incremental benefit just isn't there. Australia, again, further along uh, in there, you see as their energy use increased, uh, they dropped, um, again, incrementally, um, probably. You know, think, and why, how is this connected? Well, it's connected with uh, things like something as simple as air conditioning or as an automobile that can get somebody to a hospital, right? Um, because, you know, Australia's got that wide open, uh, very wide areas with very uh, sparse population. In the United States, further along here, and you see, and in fact, both in, in Australia, if you were to do the animation, it's clear, you can see we've kind of hooked around. We, we, we kind of peaked out in per capita energy consumption, and we're, we're kind of falling down a little bit, which is, I think, a good thing. But the message here is that if you look at, and I think he's got data for about 100 countries, they all sit on that line, right? A, 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 the, that's going from hardly any energy to some, to a little, makes a huge difference in things like child mortality. But going from a little bit to an awful lot doesn't really make a difference, right? And in fact, you don't have to look too far to find that out, right? What's the number? What's one of the biggest health crises in the United States right now? It's obesity, right? That comes from a lot of things, but certainly our more sedentary lifestyle makes a big part of that. So, so here's just a couple um, statistics that goes around is. U.S. is among the highest countries in per capita energy consumption. That shouldn't surprise anybody. But what might surprise you is out of the 35 developed countries, we're 29th in infant mortality. Right? We're not best. We're, we're, we're almost we're, we're in the bottom, you know, six of them. We're 26th in life expectancy. Right. So that high energy consumption isn't helping us. And in fact, there's a lot of research and a lot of awareness going on that it's probably being detrimental. Right? So that. So, so that's one of the arguments I want to make here is that without fossil fuels, we'd be healthier. And we'd probably be happier. Anybody who does work, you know, who's been inv who's involved with, you know, physical training and that sort of thing knows that engaging that physicality has a huge emotional impact as well. So it'd be nice if um, one of the top new pharmaceutical drugs that's coming out every year aren't antidepressant medicines, right? This, this is one of our big growth industries in the United States. Uh, and I don't think it's unrelated to, to this, this stuff we're seeing. So, um, so wrapping up, okay, on this, this part of the talk, um, I think it's important to point out that um, who we are as a species, as humanity, because we've always been smart, we've always been intelligent, we know how to make things better, right? We are almost inherently, I've heard a I, I, a friend of mine gave a great talk in an ASE conference a couple decades ago called To Engineer as Human, making the argument that engineering, this idea of manipulating the environment and making improvements, is inherently a human endeavor, right? Yeah, we, we're, getting, we're going to school and getting degrees in that, but, but we're building on a long tradition, uh, you know, that, that, that goes back to the very first, you know, caves and, and fires. We've also, we've always been innovative. That, that is really a hallmark of of humanity, and particularly of the United States. Um, and so um, we would have figured stuff out, right? We wouldn't have been lost without fossil fuels, and we won't be lost without them in the future. So a lot of things people ask me, well, what can I do, right? There's this sense of, of helplessness. And, and I think uh, this idea of what a fossil fuel free environment looks like it can give you some, 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 some guidelines for that. I think the most important thing we can do is, is uh, and it sounds like a new age term, is be mindful, right? Uh, and, and by that, it turns like you're, you make choices every day uh, that are often driven by things you're, you're not even paying attention to. Uh, our choices about how we use electricity, how we use our automobiles, what we choose to eat. I didn't even get into the agriculture area, but that's a huge sector and a huge part of this, 
this uh, issue. Um, and, and individual choices matter, right? One of the things that I think is the most important part about the arc of energy, in, particularly in the United States right now, is how much it has changed over the last two decades, almost in total absence of federal policy driving it, right? We have, you know, insurance companies won't even insure a new coal plant anymore. We're not building any more coal plants, and we're shutting them down at a very high rate. Um, not because some of that is federal policy because of the, the Clean Air Act um, governs things like uh, mercury emissions and sulfur dioxide. Uh, so you, you know, take take the carbon dioxide out of the equation for a while. There's still a lot of pressure on coal plants because they do a lot of other things to the environment that are not that are not good. Um, we shouldn't assume. We should stop assuming that more is better. Right. That's what uh, you know. And if you if you expose yourself to any media at all everything from network television to Facebook, you're bombarded by marketing, telling you you need this, you need that, you need that. And, and I think developing a resistance to that is, is just makes sense on so many levels. And, and But more importantly, don't assume that the system we have now is the best system. And it's certainly not the only system. So yes, change is hard, and change is going to require us to be engaged in, in our own personal changes, but there's an upside to that. And I think that's the most important part. Because we already see that happening, right? We see um, we see the microgrids developing. We see storage happening. There, there's this whole area that you may or may not be aware of in electric utilities called demand response, where the customers are now part of the equation. Where and, and some of you may have this on your homes or your parents' homes. Um, Ida Power has something called the AC Cool Credit Program. They'll pay you five dollars a month for the three months of summer in return for allowing them to put a little. Uh, RF receiver and a relay on your air conditioning compressor. So on days when they're having a particularly hard time meeting peak load, uh, they'll cycle off your, your compressor for 10 minutes at a time. Short enough time that it, you, you may, you know, it might mean a couple of degrees difference in your house, but, but if they do that to 10,000 of them at a time, it helps them balance their, their generation and load much better. Uh, and there's going to be more and more and more of that going on. So, so this is happening. We, we saw the, the cities are being reinvented and replanned. The urban centers that were hollowed out, in, you know, in my youth, with, with the flight to the suburbs, are now the cool places to be. Right? There's brew pubs and there's hipsters everywhere. And um, and so so that's 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 part of the really good story. My daughter lives in Central Philadelphia. She's 33 years old and has never owned an automobile. Okay? It's not like she doesn't wouldn't find it handy, but she also finds it a pain in the neck. She doesn't want to be responsible for parking it. If you're living in an apartment in an urban center, they're a big liability, right? Um, whenever she visits, uh, I don't get to drive my truck. But but other than that, um, it's it's worked out really well for her. So um, I want to end this part of the talk by kind of re re revisiting my metaphor here, right? Um, about the bus ride. So Bill McDonough was is a real vision, real thought leader in this area. He's right now writing a lot about the circular economy, which is an interview. You know, I encourage you to look that up too. Um, he came to campus. Uh, I think it was about 2007, 2008, maybe. And I got a chance to host him. I spent time with him. He's most famous for writing, co-authoring a book called Cradle to Cradle. He's, a, he's an architect, architect, uh, but really is thinking a lot about uh, how we should be handling this book, Cradle to Cradle, is about how we should be handling raw materials in the, in, in the world, uh, in our in, in the industrial economy. That there should be no waste. Everything we use, we should then we should engineer into it, into our materials and into our processes, the way to reclaim everything. And I think that's a it, it's a it's a great way to start thinking about things differently, particularly as engineers. But he once said, and I, I uh, interviewed him on Customer's Radio Show, um, where he said um, we talk about recycling. And, and uh, if you really want me to rant on for 20 minutes, we talk about recycling. But he said. We should never confuse doing less bad as the same thing as doing good. Right? And, 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 and he puts recycling in that category. He says, he says imagine you're, you know, you're on this bus and, you're, uh, and you're, you want to drive, you want to go to, to, you know, you're somewhere in the Intermountain West or in, in Wyoming and you want to go to New York City. And, and you know, you're looking out the window and you realize, hey, you know, we're headed, that sign just said we're going to Los Angeles. And we're going 80 miles an hour down this interstate. And the bus driver says, oh, OK, great, I got it. And he slows from 80 miles an hour to 50 miles an hour. So see, that's better, right? 
that's what things like recycling is. It's doing less bad. It's not doing good, right? You need to turn the bus around, and that's what we need to be doing now in the, in the broader sense. And, and there's time to do that. Time to turn the bus around and get to the destination we might get to. So, thank you. So, so I ha we have time, and I have some slides about a little bit about the campus story. Uh, but before I just jump into that, you, you know, if we want to discuss this or talk about this or, or have some questions, I'd be happy to entertain that now. Yeah. Well, John, one question. I, I appreciate your discussion on uh, uh, child, uh, uh, the study related to child uh, uh, survival. Uh, one of the things that I wrestle with, though, is uh, uh, should there be an overlay of innovation over that study because the incubator made a big difference in terms of having children uh, grow uh, past uh, an early age. And I was just wondering how that impacts that study that you You know, I think that makes, you know, that there's a lot of things, right? I mentioned air conditioning and stuff like that. Right. Does the incubator have a power cord? I'm sorry? Does the incubator have a power cord? You have to plug that in? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not suggesting uh, about uh, how much electricity, but the, the only point I'm trying to make is that there's a number of uh, innovations that have taken place sure. that have improved the child. And I think there's a lot of argument about what those, what drove those innovations. And one of the, one of the things that drove the innovation was was time on our hands. Like we were, we, you know, we, we had we didn't have to do all this work by hand. We had time to be to develop intellectually and do this sort of thing. So, so yeah, that's a really good. Yeah, yes. Um, you said in there, you know, that individual choices matter. And, you know, in my day to day life, you try to think about that. And I tell my kids, get out of the shower. You know, early. <laughs> How's and that there, working for you? <laughs> very well. Uh, and, then, uh, and then I see, you know, graphs every now and again to kind of put into context the, um, the you know, you'll see the, um, the scale of pollution by, uh, you know, by the, you know, um, you know top. top corporations in America versus, you know, the pollution is created by everybody else. And, and the same kind of energy, energy expenditure, and it just, just makes you feel like you want to throw up your hands. So is there any, from a corporate, political, what's happening? I mean, I, I think, I mean, I understand what you're saying, and, I, and I've seen a lot of those statistics. But I, I guess I don't, I don't see them as decoupled, because the corporations aren't just sitting there all by themselves, totally divorced from what we do. They're serving us. Right? They're selling products and services that we choose to buy or not. Right? So, so that personal choice directly impacts that. Um, and, and we've seen this. Um, if you get into the food stuff, right? one of the big things that came up about 10 years ago is antibiotics in milk, right? or the antibiotics used to produce milk, and, and issues that went along with that, and, or, and hormones right? that used that encourage milk, and that was getting into our bloodstreams. And so um, you know, there, was, there was this groundswell push, there was this thing, oh, we need to regulate it, we need to do this. And Walmart said, you know what? We're just going to make the decision. We're not going to let any hormone, any, any milk from, from cows that got hormones. That changed the whole industry. That one co corporation wiped that out, and that's no longer an issue. Right. So um, yeah, I mean, particularly in a capitalist society, that you know, our choices are, the, are probably the most important thing. Right? And, and to sit back and, and you know, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a neoconservative, but to sit back and wait for the government to fix the problem, you know, is you know, is to ignore the fact that we have a lot more authority than that, or a lot more. So I think Ryan, you had a question. Uh, what do you believe the, the world population would be if if fossil fuels were? That, that's a really good question. So, yeah. so world population, that's 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 uh, that's an area I, I've done some reading on, some research in. But I think the most important things we talk about, and I'll, I'll just kind of give a little bit of groundwork for that. So. Our current food production system is hugely dependent on fossil fuels. And so a, a, a very good argument would be uh, if we stopped using fossil fuels in food production, people would starve. I don't think that's entirely true because we have an incredibly, if, if, the, if, if we talk about efficiency of our food production system, meaning getting the most nutrition for the least impact, we do it all wrong, right? And, and now we're getting into some really controversial stuff, which is a plant-based diet. Because uh, I think, um, so one of the things we would have is, is a very different proportion of that. You don't have to totally give up meat, but boy, this country eats a lot of meat. And 
and if you know if you can have similar nutrition out of soy based things or you can eat the cow that's been eating 20 times more soy than the humans need that that, that, that got the that got the meat then then you, the math gets pretty simple but I think another way to think about that and it doesn't help us so much is that we while we develop these better food production systems to serve a growing population we also enable a growing population if we didn't have this much food, we wouldn't have this many people, right? It's, it's as simple as that. So there's this, there's this chicken and egg thing, and you get into some really difficult ethical questions, and, and, it, and, and, and I'm not prepared or, or qualified to really grapple with those. But I think there, that's certainly part of the puzzle. That certainly has to be part of the puzzle going forward. Yeah. Yes. So the technologies that we were looking at, the solar, the wind, and the hydro, are stuff that we, we're still using today. And even with the time to polish those technologies and refine them and make them better at doing what they do, we're still struggling to make them make a significant portion of the energy we use. Um, and kind of related to Brian's question, I think if we didn't have fossil fuels, there would probably be a little bit less people. But I feel like we'd still run into that we're not being able to generate enough power to fuel everything yeah. a little bit earlier. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I. I I disagree because for a couple of reasons. One of them is if you look at how much sunlight, the ener how much energy hits the planet on a constant basis, um, and look at how much energy all of humanity uses, the ratio is about 5,000, right? So that energy is there, right? The problem is it's distributed. It's not concentrated in a lump of coal. You have to put up these big solar collectors, right? So, so. Um, so our needs for energy, I mean, you said we don't have enough energy to meet our current needs. We would have different. Our needs would have matched that. We wouldn't have developed needs that far outstripped the energy supply because it wouldn't have worked, right? So, so, so we would have developed different society, different um, industrial infrastructure, different sets of products. You know, it, it would have been different for sure. But, but I think what we're showing now, and I know power, you know, which is, by the way, doesn't have the history of being the most progressive country and power company on the planet, has now become one of those by setting that deadline. In 2045, they're going to have 100% clean energy. They're going to, they got three really big coal plants. Um, one's going to be shut down this year. One, actually, half of one of them just got shut down last year, and they've got a big one out in Wyoming. By the way, the coal plants that serve us are not in the state of Idaho. Pretty, pretty clever of them. Um, the other one's out in, in uh, western Wyoming, uh, which is a huge plant. And their decision to actually start Looking at decommissioning that was huge. So, um, I don't want to figure out how I got down that track. <laughs> Question for you? So. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, Idaho Power is like 70% renewable energy right now. Yeah, yeah, so the hydro. Have, yeah. And other sources like some solar, some wind. Right, yeah, so yeah, if you look up their thing, and if you look at, and I've been following this for about 20 years, um, you're right, you know, early on, it, that, that sliver, the non hydro renewable, the tiny, tiny, tiny. Now it's like it's starting to, to compete with hydro. It's grown. It's it's sort of an exponential growth right now. So it's it's you know they say oh even if it doubles every year it'll take you know ten years. Ten years is short in the history of humanity and certainly in utilities have to think about 20, 30, 20 to thirty year time scale. That's why Idaho Power put that deadline. It's only twenty five years out. That's short for utility planning. That's 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 like tomorrow, right? The engineers at Idaho Power said. What? <laughs> you know, when, when they made that announcement. Yeah. Do you have a guess? What do you think would be the dominant source of energy for fossil fuels for energy generation? So, so you know, I, you know, I, you know, the, the ones we know would certainly be there, like the hydro, wind, solar. Um, I don't, you know, it's hard to know whether we find other things, whether you know how nuclear would have developed along the way. Um, uh, the, I think one of the big things that nobody talks about. So I talk about petroleum and transportation, the, the other big elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about is, is how dependent we are on natural gas, not just to make electricity, but to heat our homes and to, and to make hot water. So, so that kind of reveals a little bit about the, the business plan around a utility saying we're going to have 100% clean energy. So, so then, it, it, and I'll, I can talk a little bit about campus in the few minutes we have left. Say, so, oh, well, if our, if our electricity is going to be clean, what else do we have to address? We have to transportation, we have to address heating. And what are the answers to that? Well, if the electricity is clean, then electric cars and electric heat pumps. And there, right there, that, that reveals a brilliant move on the part of electric utilities. Because then their load, their load has been flat for decades, 
right? Even even with the growth we've had, Idaho Power has incre incrementally increased their load. Um, and now all of a sudden they can double their load by taking care of this problem. So that's a that, that's you know that's where uh, smart business and smart environmental work comes in hand in hand. Let me talk uh, just a little bit about campus. So for three years after I left the chair's office, uh, I worked up, I worked directly with President Custer mm -hmm. to uh, to look at campus sustainability issues. So one of my jobs is to do a greenhouse gas inventory for campus, and and I, I published this in 2008 and I'm sorry 2009 I think. And this is these are the, the campus emissions. It has to do with electricity, it has to do with natural gas, and, and it's an estimate, an estimate of how much the, our commuting to campus every day um, uh, contributes. And if you want an example of a really poorly structured, messy, ugly problem in engineering, that's one of them. Uh, and the university sponsored the peer travel. Right? And that's what that's kind of the protocol for, for schools that are trying to compare to each other and set set um, goals. That's the protocol that, that's been agreed upon. Uh, and so you see, over that five-year period, it's heading in the wrong way, right? Of course, this is a campus that's growing, right? That's getting more and more students. We're building new buildings, so that's not surprising. Uh, and so, if we're going to make a climate action plan, if I were to, if I were to done done that in 2008, I'd say, okay, our emissions are around 50,000. Uh, let's choose 2050 as the date we want to get the zero emissions, zero net emissions. That means. Everything we're responsible for, if there's any emissions, we do something to offset that, whether it's build solar cells or, or, or solar uh, farms or buy offsets, right? Uh, and so you can track where we are and say, um, well, if we'd have done that, we should be here, right? And remember, the line was doing this. It was going up fairly steeply. Interestingly enough, I just updated it for 2018. We went from, we should have been at 37,000, but we're only at 41,000. That's down from 50. 50,000, and, and that unit is metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. So, without a climate plan, without um, tracking this, we we did much better. So, um, here's the greenhouse gas inventory. Here's the breakdown in 2018. 40% is due to our electricity. 27% is due to commuting. 21% uh, to natural gas, and here's the air travel. This 2% is the shuttle and the, and the fleet that the, that the university made. So in 10 years, our electric use and our gas use both went up about 25%. But the emissions due to that went down 10% because we're, we, the country, the society is closing down coal plants. Our electricity is cleaner today by a good bit than it was 10 years ago without anything we committed to on campus. It's interesting, the gas use went up 24%, and not surprisingly, the emissions due to natural gas went up exactly the same, because natural gas has exactly the same content it had 10 years ago, and it does exactly the same thing. Vehicle miles traveled, their estimate of the commuting, um, went down 25%, and the, and the emissions went down 31%. So it went down faster than the actual miles, because on average, cars are more efficient now than they were 10 years ago. Uh, it went down at all, and this is kind of where I, I get some fuzzy estimates. But I'm telling you something that anybody's around already knows. We have fewer parking rooms installed on campus than we had 10 years ago. Uh, and so if, if you're really committed to, to decarbonizing campus, uh, fight over fewer parking rooms. <laughs> that's a popular person. Do you also think that that's due to trends you know, we used to be more of a, a commuter campus? Well? Right, yeah. We have a lot more. We, we, have, we have a significant number of beds you know, in our own dorm dormitories, but also you know, that whole neighborhood south of here has turned over mostly in rental, right? So, so yeah, that, that's that that's a huge impact. We they did a survey out of the Energy Policy Institute of, of a sampling of students last year and, and I use this number in this. Thirty eight percent of students responded saying they drive a single occupancy vehicle for campus. Hugely lower than I thought it was. Number of people who walk was in the double digits, number of people who ride was in the ride bikes was in the double digits. So so more people or at least a uh, 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 Similar number of people ride and walk as, as drive their cars. Yeah, 20 years when I got here, that was totally different. Yeah, perfect. Does that also like include carpooling or like how do you know about the kids that take the bus? Right. Well, all we know is that is single occupancy vehicles. That's what I track. Is okay. is cars that come to campus. How many cars come to campus? So, yeah. So the carpooling doesn't doesn't capture that. We have a carpooling program that no one takes advantage of, so I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, there yeah. is the bus for like students getting free. Right. Right. Yeah. So the bus is there, and, and they and they actually parking transportation tracks bus 
ridership. I don't have those numbers in front of me. But yeah, the, those are all things that help. So anyway, uh, going back to the climate plan, right? So this was the business, that was the curve, that was the line we were on from 04 to 08. That's the line we want to be on, and we're here. So, so that corner got turned, um, and that's with building uh, the Environmental Research Building. That's building um, the Alumni and Friends Center. That's building um, the Micron Business and Economics Building, right? So there were significant ads to the campus. Plus, we went from under 20,000 students to over 25,000 students in that time period. So, so, so this is what we do if we're just sitting back watching it happen. Um, imagine what would happen if we, if we paid more attention. Now, now that said, I know the facilities and A&E people are committed to energy efficiency when they can. Um, I know there were a lot of people that wanted to add a lot of energy efficient uh, components to the new materials building. They got overruled. We had budget issues there, so that's not going to be a, a terrible environmentally friendly building. Um, that's not a popular thing to say, but it is what it is, <laughs> as the great philosopher once said. Um, Electricity is cleaner. Um, we have fewer parking spaces at a larger <laughs> Of our students um, do something other than just drive their own car campus. So um, I'm just going to kind of jump ahead because we're running out of time. Um, so, so one of the questions you might ask is, how, you know, how did we get from this line to this line? And so this is, if you follow anything about uh, climate mitigation, they talk about the wedges. There's, so if you, you take actions and increase them over time, they offset the emissions. Mess. So that was the line we were on. And this much of it approximately would happen just because we started closing down coal plants. This much is from the transportation, and this is probably relatively the size of the efficiency measures we've taken on campus. So going forward, let's say that I don't think, let me go back here. I don't think that trend is the line we're on. In other words, we, we kind of curved around here, but we're about to open, well, we just opened the visual arts building, we're about to open this building. I got to think that we can't plan to be passively getting less and less every year. So I kind of just had a, a, you know, this sort of narrow slope that I think we're on. And remember, these are the kind of the breakdown of where those emissions are coming from. So this is what the, what the wedges would look like. So Ida Power, if we do nothing, is going to clean up the electricity. Um, changing our transportation infrastructure could, could help that. And that means more alternatives and incentivizing electric vehicles, as, they, as certainly as they become more affordable. That's a big part of it. Uh, we have to change how we heat the campus. We use a lot of natural gas on this campus, and this is where high-tech ground source heat pumps could be a big part of that. And so, so you know, mechanical engineer he says, yes, we can solve this problem. And, and Ida Barr says, boy, that would be fun. Yeah, we could do that. <laughs> is geothermal considered that? Or is geothermal is, I haven't really factored that in yet. So about a, about a dozen buildings on our campus are heated by the city's geothermal uh, system. Um, We've had some problems with that in recent years. So our facilities people are still trying to come to grips with that. So, so yeah, that's part of the integration. And you combine heat pumps with geothermal, like it's really about the right. So, um, and then we have the efficiency and offsets part. So that's I, I, I've been in discussion with some people on campus and so the, the ASBSU leadership. They're really excited about this. So we hope to be able to have you know, something very official announced within, within a year or so about that. So, one o'clock. Perfect. <laughs> we have time for probably a couple questions. Yeah. I, know I want to be respectful of your time, and then we got some of the staff classes to go to. It's Friday afternoon. Let's be real. So, don't they should look at it as a, like a total entropy of the world? So, I think there's an argument. Uh, no, I don't know how true it is, but people believe that this make these solar cells actually produce much more pollution than kind. Rather, if you uh, compare the amount of electricity that they produce, so if you produce gas electricity that they produce with the coal or with the fossil fuel, you produce less pollution. But it's just somewhere else. It's somewhere That's why we don't see. Yeah, it. it's certainly getting used, to getting getting rid of the idea of, of somewhere else would be a really good, <laughs> really good thing. Um, I don't know about the pollution issues on that. Of course, some of it is has to do with individual countries' regulations. One of the reasons that China can make them so cheap is that. A lot more regulations in, in this country, um, but uh, but to get to the energy part, there's a there's a concept called energy return on investment, EROI, right? That's that talks about how much energy did it do to, to set up this power plant, and how much do you get in this lifetime? So um, solar panels are right about five. They they over their lifetime they generate about five times more energy than it took to make them, right? Which is better than it used to be. But the, but the thing to compare that to is say, say petroleum gas wells or uh, oil wells, right? 
when we started pumping oil, we didn't have to pump oil. It just came out of the ground. We just had to catch it, right? So it was about a hundred to one return on investment, right? So about the amount of energy it took to, to, to refine, to capture it, refine it, deliver it was 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 only one one hundred, one percent, right? Now it's twenty. So it's gotten five times harder to get oil out of the ground than it used to. And that trend continues. So all this, you know, fracking, enhanced extraction, whatever you want to call it, that takes energy. And so you have these quotes about the, our reserves, how much, you know, we have hundreds of years of oil reserves. That's a meaningless number. The number is how, how hard is it to get it? Because the minute it's a one-to-one -one ratio, there's no reason to get it out of the ground. It's going to stay there. Right? We'll, we'll develop technology. We'll get more of this. But at that point, it's like, you know, like, you know the... The sun's free, you know, <laughs> you know with, with, with those environmental costs associated with it. But yeah, the solution has to be much more encompassing. So this is a necessarily simplistic representation. Well, anyway, I'm happy to hang around a little bit if you want more to talk, but I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you so much. Thank you.